I've been told these sessions start promptly and all the ones I've attended start promptly. So I guess we should get started. It's 11 o'clock uh, in Pittsburgh in, on the <laughs> East Coast in the US. Um, so I'm Tom Lowers. I'm the founder of BirdBrain Technologies. Aaron. And I'm Erin Whitaker. I am a um, middle school technology coordinator at Swickley Academy, which is a, um, an independent school um, in the Pittsburgh region. And um, I'm here with Tom today to give sort of the teacher perspective as um, when we went virtual, I was one of the ones that sort of um, found and took this remote robot um, idea and uh, implemented it for, for the rest of the school year. Yeah. Uh, yeah, which was thrilling to see even in the spring, even in April and May that you were using it already when it was very much still under development <laughs> and it is still under development. So, um, so the idea of remote robots um, came about in March when schools shut down and the idea is to allow students to program a real robot that is not physically located in the same place that they are. So over the internet, you know, viewing it through cameras or, or however and getting the program or the information to send messages to the robot so that it's actually moving and doing things in real time according to their program. Um, so this session, let me switch over to our slides. Oops. Okay. Arg. So uh, we've got the link in the chat, um, but here it is also the, the link to the slides. I'm going to give you a brief demonstration of three remote robots. I actually have a second camera in this Zoom session um, where you can see those three robots. So it's, it's uh, like, if you look at everybody, it's right here. Uh, so you can double click on that camera to, to look at that view at all times if you wanna see the robots as people are programming them. Um, so I'm going to give you a, a brief demo of those remote robots, and then I'll spend a significant period of time um, giving you an overview of how to make a remote robot using NetsBlocks. Uh, NetsBlocks, as many of you know, is based on Snap and allows uh, message, passage, message passing between um, different projects via the cloud, as well as it also has a, a bunch of other really useful and timely collaboration tools. Um, so I'm going to show you kind of the general principles of, of how to make a remote robot with anything that works, any hardware that works in Snap. And then I will show you a specific worked example of how to use it with the Hummingbird. Then Erin will spend um, time talking about um, how she taught with remote robots and what her students did and how, how this worked in a classroom um, in April and May. And then um, I will briefly go over some other ways to make this work um, that are not based on Nets blocks or Snap, just to kind of round out the picture. Um, so yeah, so let's do the demo first. Okay, so I'm going to put this link in the chat um, and also go to it directly. So this is a link that takes you to a web page, which has links to three projects that allow you to program the three robots that are in the studio. So that's the Smart House, the Jackson Pollock painting, and this Beetle. Now, all three of those robots are connected via Bluetooth to a laptop that I have sitting off screen. And there are server projects running on that laptop that are ready and waiting for you to connect to them to control those robots. Um, when you click on one of these links, you'll notice it, it's using link sharing to just open up a project in NetsBlocks. Um, you can see that this is just very much like a regular Snap interface. There are special Hummingbird blocks. If you're curious what the Hummingbird blocks do, um, there's a Hummingbird Snap blocks reference linked off the site. To connect to a robot, you would press the C key or this set of blocks, and that will either say connected or connection restarted. And then um, there's a small sample program to get you started. So I can run that and you can see it actually potentially running in the camera view here. Um, there's also some other blocks that I've placed here just to like, so that you can start modifying a program if you want. Um, and then there's some instructions here. 
So instructions in terms of which outputs, which inputs, which sensors are attached to different things, as well as some tips. Um, and then when you're done, you can disconnect by pressing the X key and that gives somebody else a try. Now what's important about this interface is only one person can be controlling a robot at a time, but everybody can be altering their programs, altering their code as they, as they see fit. Um, and so what I like to have people do is if you're controlling a robot and you're done, just put in the chat box that the robot is free. Like the beetle is now available or the smart house is now available or, or however else. So this talk isn't going to, we're not gonna spend an hour programming these robots. Although I'm gonna, I mean, I have the, the camera view and you have the links. So if you want to do that, it's perfectly fine with me. I'm happy for you too. Um, but what I'm really going to spend most of the, the rest of the time on now is um, uh, telling you kind of how to make your own robot. Um, okay, so, so that's just the demo of kind of the interface. So you can play with that as you're listening to me. Uh, and I can see that somebody's already got the beetle moving, so that's great. All right, so what is the general idea? Like, how are we doing this, right? So when I first tried to figure out how to do this in March, and I actually want to credit the Netsblocks team with giving me a lot of advice and help the first couple weeks as I was building the projects that became kind of the standard server and client projects. Uh, the first thing that I did was um, I took our Snap extension for our hardware for the Hummingbird Robotics Kit, as well as for the upcoming Finch 2.0, and I exported it. I exported those blocks from Snap, and then I imported those blocks into Netsblocks. So that's pretty straightforward. And if you see, there's actually quite a few hardware extensions um, for Snap. So if you're interested in doing this kind of thing for Arduino, or um, for like a Lego NXT package, it is possible to do it for other robots. Um, it'll require more work than it would for the, for the Hummingbird kit because I've already done it for the Hummingbird kit. And as you'll see, I've already given you some projects to basically get you started with it. Um, so once you have uh, the blocks in, not, in Nets blocks, the extension blocks, you then need to create two files. The first is a server file and the server file, sorry, the server file lives on the computer and is connected to the robot. Um, so whatever hardware extension you're using, right? Um, the way Snap typically works with hardware is it's um, connected to that piece of hardware via either um, a Bluetooth link, a wireless link, or, um, or, or a wired link. And so, um, you need to have a local laptop that is running this server file and communicating directly with the hardware. Uh, and then you need to create a client file. And that client file, that client project is what I just opened uh, a minute ago for you to try controlling the smart house. So that's, that's the file or the project that you just send to anyone. And then that client file communicates with the server file. And I'll show you kind of how that works in a second. Um, and that's, that's basically what you need. So the client file is what you would send your students um, or anyone else if you were creating a remote robot at your house. And then the last um, thing that you can do, which I think is optional, is to set up live streaming via video camera if you want people to be able to view your robots and program them 24 seven. So in this case, in this workshop, we're doing this live over video and so you can instantly see things happen as you're programming the robots. And if you were a teacher, you might have a live synchronous session with your students where you have them, you know, build their program and then watch the, watch the program run on their robot, on the robots. Um, but you can also do a 24 seven live streamed robot that is just always on. And I actually, one of the first things that I did when I figured out how to do this was I, I, um, repurposed five of our demo robots, and I put them in my house, connected to laptops, and allowed anyone to program them. And those are um, available and visible uh, on our website. Um, 
the only disadvantage of, of live streaming is that you've got like a 15 second delay when you're using li like uh, when you're using um, that type of, of live technology, live, live streaming technology um, because of the way it works. So if you're like broadcasting over YouTube or via a Nest public feed, you're always gonna have a 15 second delay. Okay, so let's do a worked example of how to turn a hummingbird kit, and I'm specifically going to turn this LB robot into a fourth remote robot that you all will be able to program. So I'm just gonna try to do this fairly quickly while still hopefully not confusing anyone. Um, all right, so I'm turning it on, it's connecting to the computer. And then I'm gonna go to a tutorial that I've created for everybody out there with hummingbird kits to build their own remote robots. Um, so I'm talking here about how you need a client file and a server file. And I've created server and client like pre-populated files that are available that you just click on. So let's go to the server project for hummingbird bit. And uh, I'll switch back to this, sorry. Um, so the server project is kind of a generic Hummingbird server project. And so there are some instructions here to tell you kind of how to alter that server project. So, you know, it's called generic Hummingbird 3. The first thing I'm gonna do is make sure that I'm logged into Netsblocks, so I am. I'm gonna save this as a, um, I call this the little bot. So a little bot server. So now it's saved. I'm gonna to go to the stage, which is where I've kept all the code. Um, I'm not exactly sure why I did that, but I did it. Um, and then all of this is essentially the, the code that is kind of running the server, taking care of the messages going back and forth. It's not, I mean, it, it's interesting to look at, but it's not necessarily meant to edit most of it, especially like the when flag clicked or the connect or disconnect logic. Um, but one thing I will do is I will edit what happens when I get various messages for various outputs. So the Hummingbird kit has tricolor LEDs, regular LEDs, servos, and uh, rotation hey, servos. Hey, Tom? Yep. This is Bambi. Um, I'm watching the chat for you. They can't see the blocks. You need to share your screen instead. I am sharing my screen. Oh, the resolution is really, I will, um, really blurry. I will increase it, but, but make sure you go to speaker view so that, like, so that my screen is the, the larger screen. But I'll also zoom the blocks. Thank you, Bambi. You're welcome. Force. It's still blurry, but I don't know why if you're already sharing your screen. I'm not sure what else you could do about that. It is better with them bigger. Okay. So, um, so an example here is, you know, this is what happens when I receive a tricolor LED. Um, and in this case, for this specific robot, I don't actually have any tricolor LEDs. So instead of you know, allowing messages to be sent that try to control the tricolor LEDs, I might just change this code, get rid of what happens here, and just say there are no tricolor LEDs. So basically what I'm doing here is I'm customizing um, the messages based on the uh, based on what's actually attached to my robot. And for a hummingbird kit, since it's so flexible and there are so many different ways to build one, it's important to do this kind of thing. It's really important when you have position servos. So with this LB robot, um, servo one controls the neck and it can move through its full range of motion without damaging the robot. But servo two controls like up and down uh, nodding and what I've found is if you move it below 90 degrees or above 130 degrees, that um, really like you might damage the robot. So I can actually bound the servos by changing the code. 
And that way my students are never going to accidentally send a command that will damage the robot in some way. If they send something that would damage the, the robot, I'm basically saying, no, instead of sending, you know, if, if you sent zero degrees to make my robot like point way too far down, I'm actually going to make that 90 degrees. So I have this bounds command here that bounds it between 90 and 130. And I can do that just if the, um, like if, uh, you know, if we're, you, if you were, we're trying to control port two. So let me, so you know, if I do like if port equals two, then bounce from 90 to 130. Otherwise you can do zero to 170. I guess I should have done an if else, but I'm going a little fast here. This should still work. So once I'm done, I'm gonna hit save on this. Uh, once I'm done making kind of the modifications that I want. And then the next thing I need to do is change the client. So I'm going to open a separate project, the client project. And the thing that I need to change here is the ID. Now the ID is what Netsblocks uses to determine where you're sending a message. So if I'm sending a message to a specific project over the cloud, then I need to give it a specific identifier. And so the identifier, you can actually get it from, sorry, the sprite here. If I call this value, I see that my identifier my public role ID is robot at little bot server at captain LED, which is my username. So I'm going to change this to robot at little bot server at captain LED, and that will set the ID. Now, the other things you might want to change here are things like, you know, what's in your, um, you know, which blocks you're giving your students to start with. Like there are no position servo three and four, so I might as well get rid of that. There's no tricolor LED, um, so I may as well get rid of that. May as well get rid of that. You know, so it's sort of a question of what you leave in. There is a distance sensor; it's attached to port one, though, so I might put that there. And maybe you know, maybe I'll make a different sample program, um, and then I'll probably want to change this block also to tell you what the outputs and inputs are. Okay, so once I've done that, I will save this as maybe little bot client. And then I will um, make sure that it is shared publicly. Okay. I'm not going to open something new. All right. So if I want to test that this is working, you know, I can, I can come back to my server and turn it on by clicking the green flag, go back to my client and see if I can connect to the robot and it says connected and see if, um, you know, moving the servos works. Oh, it says please connect first. Let me make sure that it's visible on my screen so that the server is definitely running there. Okay. Um, so um, it moved, which is great. So now as long as I make sure that the server file is visible on the screen so that it's running, um, it, it should accept commands. Whoa. Sorry. I'm not sure what just happened. Um, hold on. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. Um, yeah, so I will disconnect from this. And um, I can now give you a link that will let you control the little bot. So. The way to construct that link is 
listed down here. And it's basically just, I, I want to set the edit mode to true and the, the uh, flag to no run. But otherwise, the link that I've already got works. And so I'm going to put that in the chat. And that should now be a fourth robot that can be controlled via the internet. So that's basically the process of how you make a remote robot using a hummingbird kit. I know it went a little bit fast, but um, I also want to say like there are there is a detailed tutorial here along with essentially screen captures of me doing the same thing in video form. So it's already recorded. So if you missed something um, just right now, uh, you can you can follow along later as well. All right. So yeah, so those are these steps to making a, a remote robot. So I just wanted to see if there's anything in the chat, any questions in the chat right now. All right, so um, I see editor seems not to work in Safari, but not Chrome. Oh, um, is that, does it work in Safari or does it not work in Safari? So I, I was using Chrome, but I have heard, I think, Netsblocks does still have some of the issues of Snap last year about um, loading larger projects. And so um, it can be a little bit uh, annoying. OK. Yeah, it doesn't load in, in Safari. Yeah. Yeah, so we do recommend using Chrome both as the browser to load the server projects in, but also when you give it to your students to, um, to give them the, uh, to suggest that they load it in Chrome. All right, so just you know, a brief overview of this. The advantages of using NextBlocks for remote robots are that it's secure. There's no like, there's no remote controlling your actual computer. There's no hacking into your network. Um, really, the only danger is if somebody manages to grab your NextBlocks user ID and password, which seems pretty unlikely. And you can set limits on the motors. So you can make the position servos not move out of, out of ranges that are kind of dangerous for the robot. I've also noticed, I mean, I feel like there's a very small lag between user action and robot movement. Uh, and there's interesting IoT possibilities because um, one thing we didn't really show too much, you can definitely grab sensor data from the attached hardware and bring it back over to the client projects. Um, so, each of these actually has a distance sensor, so you, you guys can try clicking the distance sensor block and seeing what kinds of values it, it, it brings back. Uh, and you can make 24-7 live stream remote robots with, with this, which is pretty cool. Um, there's just a few limitations. I mean, I think setting up the server and client files, it's, it's certainly possible, um, I think, for many people who have significant familiarity with blocks programming languages, um, but it can be challenging for somebody who, ha who doesn't have that, uh, that background. Um, if you're on a single screen, of course, it could be tricky to like try to keep the camera view in while you're programming. So for the students, especially if they're on a smaller device. Uh, and then, of course, if you're using a streaming service like YouTube live streams, there's a, about a 15 second delay. Um, but that's the, uh, yeah. That's the quick overview of how to make a remote robot with the Hummingbird kit and the general principles of how to make it um, in general uh, with any hardware extension with Snap. OK. Can you show what is behind the Pollock cardboard? Oh, sure. So it's the um, Hummingbird controller, which runs off of a BBC microbit. Um, and then a whole mess of wires uh, going into that controller. So uh, it has three single color LEDs and two tricolor LEDs hooked up, as well as one distance sensor. All right. Um, Aaron, you want to take it from here? Yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, Tom. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background on my situation, um, like I said, I'm a, a middle school teacher. And um, I was teaching in the spring a class called Arts and Bots. Um, 
for our, our middle school classes. It's an elective class. And we're two weeks into our trimester and things are starting to go south in terms of um, what's happening with coronavirus. And we go on our spring break and halfway through spring break, they announce our shutdown. So um, I have a class that's primarily focused on building robots, programming robots. Um, and they don't have access to the robots because we're already on spring break. Um, we, we didn't give out any robots. So I'm searching for ideas. What do I do with my classes now that um, at this time we didn't know how long we were going to be out. So um, we were using the Hummingbird Bits um, kits is what the, the foundation of the, the curriculum in terms of the robot components. Um, so I, I think I actually tweeted to Tom or Birdbrain and said, hey, do you have any ideas for how we can do some simulations online? Um, and so a few weeks into it, I found that, that um, they were working on this remote robot system. So uh, I was like, this is, <laughs> this is perfect. I mean, this, this really was what saved the class in terms of um, following the curriculum as, as best as I could to what, the, what I wanted the students to do. Um, so go ahead and you can go to the next slide. Yep. So, um, so what I wanted to do with students, I guess um, what I originally had wanted students to do when we were in class is usually they are working together in groups creating some sort of robot project that they chose the theme, they design it, they build it, um, the robots have to work together. So I'm like, what can I do that can sort of mimic this same idea when students are at home? And so what I, I eventually did was I wanted to create this robot dance party. So um, they weren't necessarily able to come up with like a theme like normally in class. I sort of created the theme of a robot dance party, uh, but they were still able to sort of create their own robots. So students were, were placed in groups of three. So I had three students per one robot. Um, and the idea was they had to create some programming that would make the robot uh, dance along to a song. So with that, you can go and click. Um, so what I had them do first was they used Google Drawings um, as a collaborative tool along with Zoom. Um, we used some breakout rooms in Zoom and they um, designed their robot, sketched it out, labeled it. And what was really interesting um, about this was um, the importance of detail. Now, one of the things I focus on in my class is using the design process. So we don't necessarily jump right into the robot parts. There's a, a lot in terms of what is the planning? What, is, what, is the, what are the, the written parts and how do we plan before we actually build? And so um, the students had to plan out what they wanted to do. And it's always interesting because what they think is detailed detailed is not necessarily detailed enough. And so I had one uh, group of students who, when they were labeling their robot, they just put LED light. And so I just put an LED light on their robot and then they came back to me and, and they said, well, we wanted a tricolor LED light. And I said to them, well, you didn't specify tricolor LED light. So it's a good conversation piece um, about design and planning um, and how that's an important piece to the whole design process itself. Um, so after they created um, their sketches, I built the robot. So that's the piece that really they missed out on is the whole idea of building the robots. I actually had them um, go to one of Birdbride's webinars and they created their own robot, some of their own pieces, but it wasn't an actual robotic robot. It was sort of just the, the crafty part of it. So I built the robots with the Hummingbird um, bit kits, um, added the components based on their drawings. Um, and then, the, um, and then I also created the client and server code. Now, when I came about this, I was sort of um, following the, the Birdbrain's um, website. And so as soon as they came out with the directions, I went and I created the, the client code. So this was before they even, I think, had the YouTube videos out. So I was just following their, their text-based um, um, examples and, and, and how to do it. And I would say it probably took me about an hour um, to get everything figured out and set up following those. I think um, watching the videos now, that probably would have helped me a little bit more. So they're really great resources. So if you didn't follow along with Tom um, on how to do everything in his parts before, before here, um, I recommend going back and looking at the tutorials that he has because they're, they're really easy to follow along. Um, and like I said, it took me about an hour to get everything set up um, to, to get my students going. 
Um, so I created the code and then I used um, YouTube Live uh, because I wanted my students to be able to program it on their own time. Um, one, because there were three students per one robot. And so it, I just felt it would have been a waste of class time to have an actual class with all of them together with only three robots. So this allowed them to get on when they were available, connect without having to wait for the other students. Um, and so that's what I did. Now, YouTube Live, you have to reset it each day. I think it's a 12-hour limit. So what I would do is each morning, I would set up the, um, the YouTube Live and then email all my students the link um, to the live feed, and they would just check their emails to get that link. Um, and like Tom said, there is a little bit of a lag in terms of um, the the, when they program it to when they're actually going to see the robot move, which can be a little bit of an adjustment and students are not very patient. And so I had to tell them several times when, when they would email me and say, it's not working. I would say, did you wait a few seconds? Did you wait 10, 15, 20 seconds? So, um, so their patience level of that instantaneous wanting it to work was a little bit of a learning curve for them. Um, the other piece that I really didn't think about when I first created this project that, that I sort of had to rethink as I was going along was, the idea was to have the robot dance to the music. Well, if the song starts, but the robot is delayed, um, they had to get creative on how to match that up. And so, um, again, it was a good learning opportunity because then some students were like, well, what I'll do is I'll run my program and when I see the light turn on, I'll hit play on my computer so it lines up. So again, that problem solving in a way that I really didn't think about um, what's happening and some students figured it out some students we just had to have a discussion on what do you think are good ways to um, to make it so that those can sync together um, so those so those are just some things that, that came along the way when as I was figuring out this whole thing and like I said there's it, it was a learning process for for me as well um, so like I said students worked at their own pace it was about a three-week project uh, so I think our normal class schedule will be twice a week for an hour each is usually if we were on campus what the schedule would be so i would say like over the course of three weeks they were probably working on it for two hours um, each week on getting their their robot up and running um let's see here oh so when they were working on their code then so i didn't necessarily i wasn't necessarily live with them um but what they did is they would send me their code so that i could check in on it they wrote reflections and they, they, I had created a Google slide portfolio template. So they would write reflections on what they did. So that was documenting their learning along the way. And then I would set up office hours. Um, so rather than having a class at a specific time, I would say, okay, I'm available at this time, this time, this time, let's set up a meeting, which allowed me to work more individually, either in small groups or individually with the students on either debugging their code or just reviewing what they, what they were uh, working on or how far along they were. Um, and, and it was a range of students. I had um, some students that, that struggled a little bit. Um, partially, I mean, we were all figuring the whole virtual thing out um, as it was. Uh, but then I had some students who really took off with this project. And I have a, a video uh, coming up. I'll show you an example of one of my students that just, he, he took off with this. And I, I hardly even helped him, but he was just so into it and um, ended up with a really, really cool project. So on the next slide is an example of the robots. And again, they're, they're nothing fancy. Tom's robots are definitely more fancy than my robots. But again, this was me um, pulling things out of my recycling bin <laughs> based on what the students' drawings were. And so what I ended up creating were three robots and I named them accordingly. So you got Nutribot, Velveeta Bot, and Quaker Bot <laughs> were the names of them. And so when I created my files, it was the Nutribot server file, Nutribot client code, so I, I named them accordingly so that I could keep track of which robot was which. Um, I, I, it was a little tricky for me because I actually didn't have the Bluetooth adapter. So I actually had to have one robot per laptop. Um, so fortunately, I was able to contact my um, our tech director and he had a few extra laptops laying around school that he, he said I could come in and grab real quick. So I had a whole string of laptops sitting in front of these robots that were um, that had the server code running on them so that when the kids had, had, were programming with their client, it would, it would uh, talk to the server code and send it to the robots. So the next page, this is a little video of one of the students and it should automatically play. Um, so this was a uh, Belvita bot and I don't, hopefully you can hear the audio with us in a second. I don't know if you're able to 
Oh, there we go. So you can see on the robot, they got the LED lights in the front. There's the rotational server on the side. There's a positional server on top. Um, and you have access to this video also in the slideshow um, that, that we linked at the beginning here. Um, but I, again, you, if you can hear the, the, the music, it's the beat of it. He's got the, the different parts at different times. And uh, I screen captured a little bit of code there um, that he had, he had a lot of code. <laughs> And this, what I did is I took about, I think it was like a minute and a half of a song um, that they were to program. Um, and like I said, he just kind of took this project and, and ran with it. Um, and this was his, his final project here. So a few takeaways and reflections, I guess, that, that I had uh, coming from this was the first, the biggest thing for me was like, I was able to have students design and program their own robots, which when we, when they told us we were going virtual, I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And so this really was like the thing that saved me was having these virtual collaboration tools, as well as this remote coding that, that I was able to figure out. Um, was it perfect? No, but it was way better than anything else I would have probably come up with. Um, in terms of having them be able to go through that design cycle, to program, um, and, and have that iterative uh, process still somewhat there. Even though they weren't able to build their actual robot, um, I was still able to get those other two elements in. Um, a few things that I learned along the way, um, and Tom had mentioned this, is setting the parameters on the server code. Um, I had one student, and, and again, I was creating this, I think, the day after Tom was posting these things, so I was trying to do this really quickly because my classes were going on at the same time. Um, so I did not change the parameters. And I don't know if I just overlooked that stuff. It, it, it's just I was, I think, rushing to try and get it set up. But I didn't change the parameters. And there was one robot, even though I told the students, you can't put the servo more than 90 degrees. There was always that one student that would always change it to the wrong, wrong degrees. Um, so that part is important um, to make sure you set those parameters so that the robot doesn't break, especially if you're going to do it in an asynchronous way where students are doing it at their own pace. Um, I had a pretty small class. Uh, I think there was only nine kids in this class. Um, but I can see like where if you have more than 16, 17 kids, uh, it, it can be more challenging in terms of like the time it's going to take, the number of robots you would need, um, and, and devices. So it's just something to, to think about depending on how large your class is, you might have to break it up into different um, into two groups of, of what they're doing. Um, I mentioned the audio was tricky to incorporate with a time lag. Um, but again, it, that was part of the problem solving process. And I thought that my students did a good job of figuring out um, interesting solutions to that. Um, Tom had mentioned uh, sensors can be added. Uh, but again, that, that does require more synchronous time together. So after this project, um, I did move on. I think the last two weeks of school, we did do some work with um, sensors. But that was more I, had, I, I scheduled time with small groups where we were working synchronously through Zoom meetings um, so that they could see the reaction. So I was turning lights on and off or putting things in front of the robots if they were using a distance sensor. So that requires a little bit more synchronous planning. Um, and then the biggest thing was uh, for any teacher, for anything, especially in virtual environment, is just the ability to be adaptable and flexible and meet the needs of students. Uh, I had one student in particular that he just struggled, I think, with virtual school in general. And so um, I ended up just cutting his song. I said, okay, just do 30 seconds of the song. Um, so you just have to adapt and meet the needs of the students. It's, it's really hard to, to gauge where they're at virtually. Um, at least I struggled with that going from brick and mortar to a virtual setting. Um, so I, I wanted to make sure that I was being flexible because I didn't want them to lose the interest of programming because they were so frustrated with, with what was happening. Um, so just being flexible was, was important to me. Does anybody have any questions regarding the whole teaching, implementing it in a classroom?
And I will say, um, right now, my school does plan to go back to school. We'll see if that changes in the next day, week, <laughs> weeks. Uh, I think we start September 2nd. Um, I have a feeling at some point, though, we may have to go back to virtual. And even when we do go back, I know we have a lot of restrictions in terms of collaborative spaces. So I might be even using some of these tools, even if we are in school, um, just to, to make sure that students are socially distancing and not um, crowding each other. Um, it, it seems so counterintuitive to me because I do so much in a collaborative spaces, um, so, um, but I, I do plan to keep working um, with these tools because I think it's, it's necessary and needed. Erin, I think you have a question from John. Um, if any of the robots moved, like were wheeled? Yeah, so I had one student that was adamant that he wanted like a wheeling, like a robot that had wheels on it that would move around. And so what I told him was I actually like propped it up uh, so I propped it up so the wheels wouldn't, wouldn't actually, well, the wheels would run, but it wouldn't be on the ground to move while he practiced. And then I scheduled a time individually with him and said, when you are ready to test it, we'll get on a Zoom meeting and test it together. And so that's what I did with that student um, was, um, was meet with him individually when he was ready to test it out. And so we had some video of his kind of moving around on the ground and stuff. Uh, well, I, I do have the battery packs. So... Um, it was able to go cordless, um, so that part of it, but you can't really do that asynchronously, um, otherwise you're gonna have robots roaming around the place, and my dog would have way too much fun with that, I feel like. <laughs> um, let's see, any other questions? Yeah, it was about 15 seconds. I see some people asking about the time, um, and that's, that's about right. It was about a 15 second delay, which for middle schoolers is, is forever. Uh, <laughs> um, but once they get used to it, they'll, they'll, they'll figure it out. Um, do you have a student robot ratio that you recommend? Um, that's a good question. When I am in school, I don't like to have more than uh, two students, a two to one ratio. Um, but in terms of a virtual environment, um, I would say you could have, depending on how you set it up, um, you, you could have three, four, five kids if you're planning to do it asynchronously because they can be doing it at different times um, and you can collaborate in a virtual environment still um, with getting everybody's input. Um, but when I'm, when I'm physically in school, two, three at most is usually um, what, I, what I like to have. I think more than that, um, there's always one person that tends to not do what they should be doing. <laughs> Any other questions that I missed? There's a discussion on delay that I'm just going to add to um, briefly, which is that I I am delaying the messages a little bit between the client and server so as not to overload the server. If somebody calls a forever loop and and calls a ton of of commands, then I I try to um, I think I put in like a two or three tenths of a second delay in every single client server client block uh, to prevent that from happening. Um, okay. Uh, so Aaron. Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll ask. Um, so I, I know you did it with the classroom and it's remotely and you also set up a, a, a Google Slides for them to plan out and sort of use it like as a portfolio to write stuff out. Do you do you do any parts where you're like maybe pair programming and you're having having them divide up the tasks so maybe two people are working on a particular thing so they can do some collaboration work or is it yeah. independent? So, so that's a good question. Now, so I should, I, guess I should be more specific. They collaborated together on one robot, but they each had to do their own code. So for this project, they each were doing their own code. Now, I didn't realize until actually this conference that there was a collaborative feature in NetBlocks. And so that's something that I'm going to work with now because I was like, oh, this is, this is like Google Docs and stuff where they can just program together. Um, I still don't think I would have more than two or two kids programming together collaboratively in that way. Um, again, just to hold accountability, especially with middle school students. Um, but if, in terms of my project, it was one robot for three kids, but each kid was responsible for their own code. So thank you for letting me clarify that. Yeah, that's actually an interesting point because that's different than how it is in the, when you're in a physical uh, classroom and doing hummingbird projects, you know, usually 
um, there's either one person who's writing all the code or they're pair programming and they're writing it collaboratively. But it may actually be something of an advantage that every student, you're making sure that every student is writing, writing some program, right? Um, yeah. So nobody's getting to skate by on that. Uh, all right, so I just wanted just to round out this discussion to talk about two other ways that you can make remote robots or that you can use this concept of like the robot is, you know, at the teacher's location and the students are somewhere else and you're collaborating over the internet. Um, hey, Tom, we can't hear you if you're talking. Sorry about that. Rookie mistake. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, so I, I wanted to just round out the discussion with two other ways that you can do remote robots uh, with various tools, um, just so that you're aware of other ways that you can do this concept of the, you know, the teacher has a robot at their location and the students are collaborating with them remotely or over the internet. So one that is really straightforward um, and obvious, but definitely has limitations is to allow students control of your computer via Zoom. So you can, you, there is a remote control feature in Zoom, and that way, you know, you could have an IDE open or a programming environment open, and they could be programming, um, programming directly on your computer. Uh, one of the nice things about, you know, these video conferencing applications, and I think this is true for all of them, is you can call in as with multiple devices, right? So if you wanted to establish a second camera view that is, you know, looking at the at the robots while the student is, you know, operating uh, your computer, you can just call in from your phone and then have the phone pointed at the robots and use the phone camera for like the, the robot view, the way we have like the smart house view um, here in the studio. Um, of course, you know, you're giving people control of your computer. So this is probably not something you can do asynchronously. Um, it really only works for very small groups, probably two or three students maximum, because only one of them is going to be able to control at, at once. Um, so it's pretty, um, pretty time and labor intensive, but it is, it is possible and pretty cool. Um, so I've talked about these. And then another way to do it is to use Microbit Classroom, which is, um, applies for anything in the Microbit hardware ecosystem. Um, and there you can basically share, have students share code and, um, and actually you can watch as the students are creating the code kind of in real time. So it's good for live synchronous sessions. Um, the trick with this is you have to, you know, take a student's code and then download it onto your robot and then, you know, show them the robot running with their code downloaded sort of in the Zoom chat or in the video chat also. So, um, so yeah, these, these are both other options. So this, this is not an idea that is necessarily um, uh, specific to any one technology. There's a few different ways to get at it, uh, but each way that you get at it has kind of its own advantages and disadvantages. Um, personally, I like the Netsblocks technique because you know, just like in Snap or any live coding language, you click on blocks and you instantly see them, you know, especially if you're over a, a, a video chat, you instantly see things happen. Um, and so there, I think there's a lot of advantages to that. Um, yeah, so here are just some links on uh, these various different techniques. Uh, we're doing a webinar, Aaron and I, on Friday. It's basically this webinar. I think we might adjust, we might talk about Microbit Classroom a bit more, but um, it's essentially this. So uh, probably not too much reason to, to um, uh, go to that, but you can um, email us if you're interested in setting this up. Uh, I am really in excited actually at the idea of people using these technologies um, in the fall um, to kind of try to make it possible for people to continue programming real robots as opposed to, you know, a simulation or uh, just a, a, an animation or something like that. So any last questions? I'm going to go back to this view so you can see me. Or you can just play, play with the robots for the next 10 minutes. That's fine too. <laughs> 
Hi, this is Akos uh, from the Netsblocks team. So first of all, this is super cool and we are, this is a great uh, use case for, for, for Netsblocks too. So I, I really enjoyed uh, the talk and the, of course your work too. So this is, this is great. Uh, I just want to add it yet another way of making robot, uh, robotics possible. So Netsblocks actually comes kind of support uh, out of the box, so to speak, for Wi-Fi enabled robots. So we have a, a, an addition to Netsblocks called Roboscape and Wi-Fi robots can actually directly talk to the Netsblock server. So you don't need the, the server component of the, of, of, of in this setup. Uh, so I just wanted to, to put that in there. So I can, if anybody is interested in that, I put a link to, to the web page that kind of describes that. But that's probably more for more advanced users, not for middle schools, but more for high school students. Oh, thanks for the link, Akos, and, and thanks for your help again in, uh, in March and trying to set this up. Oh, no problem. This, this is a really fun project. Yeah. Um, let's see, any other? Someone oh. asked about uh, router acts or router. Yeah, like router. Yeah, I didn't have, I mean, there was nothing I had to do. I mean, it worked fine over my, my Wi-Fi, so. Yeah, I thought you might have to open a port or something, but nope. apparently not. That's, that's one of the nice things. It really requires no, no IT configuration in that way because your, your laptop is just serving the information. Uh, the only thing I've had trouble with is keeping the Nest cameras up and connected to my Wi-Fi network indefinitely. And sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm running the robots off low-cost laptops, so sometimes Windows wants to do an update and yeah. So there's those, there's those issues, but that's more if you really want to keep your robots running all the time, which is challenging. Yeah, I had a few times where my, uh, I think my live feed went down, but I think it was due to the overload of all the things I had, plus my kids watching Netflix and gaming and <laughs> all that. So I had to sort of balance out when, when things were, were on. <laughs> yeah, I, I upgraded my internet connection in March. As yeah. A, as part of this. This is Akash. quick question. So, so running those Netsblock server projects continuously for days. You, did did you run any issues? Did they crash after a while, or or they just keep running? They keep running. Though that hasn't been an issue actually um, at all. So, I think occasionally I see like Netsblocks has been updated, and if I see that, I will kind of reload the project. But I think that message, I, I mean, there have been entire weeks where I didn't check on them. So um, it hasn't really been an issue. It's more like Windows Update decides to update the laptop. That that kind of thing has been much more of a problem. Yeah. Uh, the, go ahead. Uh, so I, yeah, I was going to ask that if you, um, I, know, I don't know if you explain how you set it up on that side. But you have four robots now sitting on your display area. So do you just run four separate instances? It's different tabs on your uh, single machine, and it's it's running four different server sessions, one per per device. Or I, I actually have a, a separate laptop, so I'm running off of two computers. But okay. with with our technology, with Hummingbird kits and Finches, you can connect up to three devices, three Hummingbirds or Finches, to one laptop. Um, and so I am running three separate server instances in three different windows. Um, and I've kind of, one thing I've noticed is they, they need to be visible uh, in order to be running. And so I, I make sure that at least a sliver of each uh, uh, browser window is visible on the desktop. Because if I minimize it, it'll stop running eventually. The, the same is true for even the students with their client code, I notice if they, ran their client code and then went to different tabs, sometimes because their client code wasn't what they were clicked on, it would stop and they'd be like, well, why isn't it working? And so I would say, okay, you need to have your client code open and your, the video feed sort of parallel both showing at the same time. Yep. So yeah, I don't know if you can move your camera or maybe move your, I don't know, put your camera at the little, your laptop, your uh, server setup. So yeah, I think I can do that. Kind of informative. <clears throat> um, so let's see. Um, okay, this is 
Can you see that? Uh, hold on, let me go back to you. Windows running the free. Ah, uh, okay. Set up here. Okay. All right. Hey, welcome to Snap. <laughs> And, and that's basically a Chrome thing, right? So if you have tabs, uh, only the one which is visible is, is running JavaScript code. So that's not an ad log thing. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, we have about four minutes left. Um, if anyone else has any questions, I'll stay until noon just for the people who are still playing with the robots a little bit. Um, yeah. Thanks to everybody for coming today <laughs> on a Sunday morning or afternoon or evening, depending on where you're at. Yeah, thanks all. <laughs>